Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's Tech Talk conducted by the ACRM Technology Networking Group. If you are not a member of the Technology Networking Group and would like to join, please visit the website provided on the slide or contact one of the co-chairs, uh, Tracy Wallace or Rachel Prophet. Their email addresses have been provided here. My name is Shutanuka Bhattacharya and I will be uh, moderating today's talk. Uh, I'm the co-chair in the communications task force in the ACRM's technology networking group. And our speaker today is Ms. Tammy Richmond, and she will be speaking today on telehealth, COVID-19 and beyond, policy updates, resources, tools, and care uses. Uh, before we get started with the presentation, I do want to advise that this meeting is being recorded. I'd like to ask all attendees to keep your phones or mics muted and keep your cameras turned off throughout the presentation. We do expect to have about 15 to 20 minutes available for discussion at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions, please type them in the chat feature and we will address as many of those as we can during the latter, half, latter part of the hour. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Ms. Tammy Richmond. Ms. Richmond is a leading expert in clinical rehabilitation and wellness services with over 30 years of experience. She's a consultant in practice operations and management and an entrepreneur and leader in advancing emerging practice areas, including telehealth. Ms. Richmond served as the chair of the Telerehabilitation Special Interest Group of the American Telemedicine Association and has co-authored national and international standards and guidelines and spearheaded policy initiatives to facilitate telehealth innovation, practice adoption and reimbursement. She has also taken on the task of being the co-chair for our telehealth task force group within the ACRM's technology networking group. I welcome uh, Ms. Richmond, and I really look forward um, to your talk today. And I'll now uh, turn the presentation over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Let's see here, we'll get started. Again, uh, I am Tammy Richmond. It's a pleasure to be here and also to be a part of the uh, tele technology networking group and a brand new telehealth task force. So part of our strategic goals moving forward will be to continue to provide all of the memberships and non-members some information around telehealth policy standards of care and so forth. So I'm really excited to use this opportunity to kind of jump in and start that conversation here. As a disclosure, I do own a telehealth platform company called, called Go to Care. We provide services, consultation, and the technology itself. And as you know, we are still sitting in the pandemic, but it looks like from this side, you know, on the better side of it uh, beginning to improve. And so we'll talk about what that's gonna look like for uh, rehab care and services and, and models, care models moving forward as we come to the end of this calendar year. So this webinar is all about covering federal policy, case uses, and resources. Just so we're all on the same playing field, uh, both in terminology and just where we kind of understand where we came from to understand where we are today. I thought I'd spend just a couple of moments under, you know, sharing with you sort of the history of telemedicine. So in its true definition of being an information and communication delivery services, we have the first radio communications back in 1900s. But I would suggest to you that we really saw the clinical use of technologies using uh, in healthcare when we started sending people into space, right? We needed to monitor those flights uh, and the astronauts in their healthcare while they were there. And then fast forward to, unfortunately, the wars that we had 2008 in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, which was sort of piggybacking on the Obama administration and its interest in the Affordable Care Act. So during those wars, we had uh, living examples and certainly I saw this when I joined the American um, Telemedicine Association where we were, where the systems were triaging uh, injured soldiers 
uh, in the field and that information was being beamed back to experts at Walter Reed, let's say, and care was being delivered, plans of care being decided through paraprofessionals and this Humvee. And so when I joined the American Telemedicine Association in 2008, that's what I saw. And it was amazingly uh, important uh, to understand that it was already here. Um, and, and just a little bit about me is that that's I, when I learned about telemedicine back then through a meeting I attended, I had no idea that there was a whole field and industry dedicated to the use of technology in healthcare. I decided at the time to really dedicate myself into understanding it and understanding how it may emerge in rehab. And here we are today. So policy wise, the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010 and it was really centered around this triple aim of healthcare reform. Three important tenets of that was the care experience, the population health and the affordability of care. And this was piggybacking on sort of the failure of managed care to control cost. So the first emphasis was just looking at those cost centers and understanding that most of the costs are relegated to disease management, chronic disease management. And then looking at what could we do to not only make care more affordable, but to use what we have today to make care even a better experience. And so technology was written in, in and out of that huge document everywhere. Without technology, the healthcare reform would not be able to exist. And I say that because it was so important when we moved into this pandemic that we already had the foundation. Amazingly, we had the foundation already there to use technology of which to educate, you know, reach out, have access to um, consumers and our population, not only throughout the country, but the world, because we were in a complete shutdown. So I just wanted to reintroduce to you this triple aim of what healthcare reform was established in 2010. We will see that under the Biden administration that we'll be having many more conversations around the Affordable Care Act, uh, looking at bills that either will change parts of it or keep most of it, and you, for you, the membership to understand how it got here, how did we, you know, get technology uh, into healthcare, and for an example of, of how that started, one of the first um, goals of the healthcare reform package was for folks to in hospital systems to establish a medical record, right, electronic medical record. So those those first initiatives were establishing that data. And from there, there was other initiatives written into the Affordable Care Act. And when I got involved in here around 2008 to 2012, from that policy, from that Affordable Care Act, and from organizations like ATA, there began to develop the terminology, the definitions of the first service models, the first care models, and that's of which we are building upon today. So I wanted to just share with you where, what that means. And so here we are, we have both clinical and non-clinical uses of telehealth technologies or ICTs, information and communication technologies. We often write about it in the form of clinical care. And certainly in the position papers of our allied health professions, that's how we approach it. How do we use technology to deliver our services digitally that mimic or have the same quality as in person. So again, just so you understand, there's non-clinical and clinical parts of telehealth. Then we looked at what were we doing with this technology? Well, we were, infor we were capturing information, all sorts of information, right? So clinically, I was establishing a relationship with my patient online. And in the asynchronous moment, I may be asking for other information that was being captured in different ways. So in the hospital model, you may see, as you know, um, MRIs, x-rays, all of that modalities, testing assessments being done digitally and being pushed into your electronic medical record. In the beginning of software, right, apps, so along this time of 2008, we also saw the iPhone, we also the ability to text, to have applications, downloadable moments. We had the just advancements of technology itself. And so there's lots of ways to, to capture information. So again, in the world of rehab, I was in the position to look at where do we and when do we need information and how are we going to capture that? So we have audio, video, and still photos. And that leads us to the terminology that was in existence when I became aware of telehealth technologies and how we will continue to change 
some of that terminology moving forward. So in its simplest form, we have web-based services that include synchronous, asynchronous video conferencing like we're doing today, streaming media with software solutions and vendors. We have what we call mobile health, which is really sort of the iPad, the iPhone apps, sort of your, your mobile, it's mobile, it goes with you. I'm not in front of it like I am now a desktop computer performing you know, my types of care. At the time when I got involved, we didn't have software that always worked across all types of devices, but now today we do. And then we had in the beginning mobile health vans, which was with the hospital system sending out vans to capture folks who lived in rural areas that could go in for testing assessments in this van that would send the information back. And then in term that we use in our position papers, but I would suggest you will change very quickly is what we call enhanced interactive. So that captured other types of technology of which we may use as an intervention. Um, so virtual reality, robotics, gaming, uh, assisted, assisted um, technology and splints and so forth. The Affordable Care Act recognized these telehealth benefits. And I bring this up today because this is where we're going to have to focus our research at and our discussions and our article building and policy building from here. So again, we understood that having access was important to care because if we can grab that early symptom, we know we can, we can provide the right side of sort of services at the right time. We also understood that accessibility of services is really around teaching, consultation, monitoring, being able to survey and keep our people in place in their home, in their working community, and keep them well. So again, technology itself, even hardware, cell phones, you can see how we can reach out and be in touch with anybody anywhere at, the, at, at that time. So accessibility of services, um, increased quality of care, which is an interesting thought, right? So how do we increase the quality of care through technology information? And it was suggested, and we will need research to prove this, to have the evidence behind, number one, that the continuity of care can continue because I always have the accessibility to reach out to my patient. That we can care manage better through chronic disease management by having the ability to reach out and touch base with our patients and vice versa. Give them the software, give them hardware that tracks their symptoms, that feeds us information at the same time. So there is a dual relationship into the quality of care. And then again, improving care because we have the electronic health record. So as we give it information, that record goes with that patient. Therefore, when they go to the next practitioner, there is the quality of care that we would want. So we're not missing information. And that leads to the last important telehealth benefit category, which is improved outcome measurements. So what do we do with that data? How do we provide either new standards of measurements or assessments, or how do we take the measurements that we were using and doing and how do we apply those to a digital relationship and then different ways to measure outcomes by these monitoring devices is there a way to con con constantly improve the outcome by implementing an app, an app on their phone or other modalities in the in the process of the plan of care that gives us outcome measurements that we can use to identify these benefits of telehealth moving forward and I say that because telehealth is not going away. That's today's number one message. Number two message is we're going to be integrating it into our daily care plans and into the ongoing business models and service models that we use every single day. Now, it will be reshaped and, and remassaged, and, and we'll need to develop several different things around that, but that's where we're headed. So I wanted to share with you what the barriers to adoption look like prior to the pandemic and what those may still be when we come out of it at the end of the year. So we always had broadband issues. We still do. There's lots of federal bills looking at how do we extend the broadband coverage, because at this point, some people can only be reached by telephone. And prior to the pandemic, telephones were no longer a covered and billable service that came back with the waivers, which I'll talk about. We in Allied Health were not provider eligible, um, eligible providers for 
for Medicare participants. Um, the Medicare telemedicine laws were, were established in the 1980s and our names were not on that. I can tell you that I have been sitting in organizations and on committees working hard to get us on that Medicare provider list. It was interesting at the beginning of the pandemic with a simple wave of HHS secretary that we were suddenly allowed to provide care, which I will also talk about moving forward. And then again, looking at licensure portability, will I continue to have access to my patients as they move around the country, since we do have a lot of movement going on at the beginning and the end of the pandemic? Lack of reimbursement, which was handled really easily. Again, with that simple wave of the hand, um, I could get paid for, folks would get paid for uh, telehealth services, which was a barrier even in a parity state, in a state like California, which was mandated to pay. We still had payers refusing to pay because there wasn't enough evidence of the service model. And again, going forward through this, we didn't have adoption on both the provider end, which is a, was a major barrier to adoption, and we didn't have enough users. Now we have tons of users, we have lots of providers, and capturing how that experience went will be important to sustainability for us. And then I will address privacy and security concerns here in a minute. So moving forward, let's agree on a couple of things. Let's all agree that telehealth is a technology. It's not a, it's not a service specialty. It is the use of technology of which we deliver services. And we can deliver all four, or I will cover these all five types of services through technology. So again, I do see springing up with certification programs around telehealth specialists. I, I like to discourage that because it's not really a specialty. It's really the fact that you'll need to show competency in using technology to deliver services. And I think that's where it needs to stay. Otherwise, what happens when we get carried away in certification programs is that the payers will latch onto that and decide they can't pay us unless we are certified. <laughs> which is what they would love to do. So also let's agree to certain definitions moving forward that are gonna stay the same regardless if we're in a pandemic. So synchronous means live and interactive and in our position papers and in policy, both federal and state, it is declared face-to-face. -face. And I bring that up because I have read articles in the past year, which confuse the reader because face-to-face -face sounds like it is me physically sitting in front of my consumer and having a relationship. When in policy, we actually use the word face-to-face, -face, meaning video conferencing. And so I just bring that up as folks are writing research that you're very careful about this terminology because it will be interpreted differently when it comes to payment and in and matching up language in our policies. Asynchronous is stored and forward. All, any information that's captured is stored and forward and falls under the asynchronous. We have seen states go back and look at whether or not they will continue to pay for just the sending of information. And that becomes important mainly in the, we see this early examples in dermatology where you're capturing uh, a picture of somebody's skin and they're using that to provide the plan of care. And, and the dermatologist came out early and said, we need to bill for all that time looking at this captured information. Moving to the right side here, originating site of care is where the patient is, not us. It's where care is given. That's the site where the patient is sitting and we are the distant site where the provider is located. That'll be important when we look at licensure portability. So as we moved into this pandemic, we recognized through our, our professional position papers and world professional uh, position papers that we can provide these five service models through technology. We can provide evaluation and assessment, consultation, intervention, monitoring, and supervision. These particular service lines in these categories were important as I got involved because we needed to match the language of other healthcare providers. Doctors are in consultation. They had consultation codes. We had consultation codes until a couple of years ago, and because they were underutilized, they were removed. Um, monitoring. We don't talk enough about patient remote monitoring because we're left out of, out of that category of telehealth services. I would suggest to you here that we look at being able to provide consultation and monitoring moving forward out of the pandemic, but otherwise we think of services through technology being evaluation and intervention and also supervision, right? The supervision of our assistants, our aides and our students as they go out and do field work. We certainly had that experience during this pandemic. 
So let's look at what happened during the beginning of the pandemic. And we're going to then end with what it looks like kind of at the near the end as the public health emergency at this point sounds like it'll be declared over on December 31st of this year. So a year ago, March, we had the COVID-19 being recognized as a public emergency, health emergency. As you know, we all sat through sadness and the shutdown of our cities and our country and the world. The federal government needed to have a way to provide health care since this was a health care problem and allow health care providers to continue to have care. People were in the middle of care and of life when this happened. So the federal government waived all all of those restrictions, those barriers that you saw in an earlier slide, they were gone through waivers, 1153 waivers. And also over the next couple of months of March, April, May, we saw that payers and payment systems and, and federal laws and CARE Act allowed all types of providers, including us to provide services and get paid for our service, regardless if it was in person or done online. So this kind of wraps up what happened in the beginning of the, of the first four or five months of last year. We call it the CARES Act 1135 waivers. You may see this, these letters, that these numbers, that's what they mean. It allowed the feds to make all these changes. And then each state had to adopt these same waivers, same language, or they had to draw up executive orders that supported these federal regulations and waiver language to comply with it. And that made we had reimbursement and that meant for us so we could provide services. And here in my practice, I continue to also see patients in person. As long as I was, you know, OTs, PTs, we were part of the essential service package here in California. So I was still seeing my patients in person and giving them the option to be and go online, which some of them and a lot of them did. And a lot of my new clients came to me and they were also online. So again, having the option in a state where I was, we were part of the essential service package where we could continue to see patients online if we followed you know, the PPE guidelines. So in a, in a quick wrap up, CMS, which dictates federal insurance beneficiaries, allowed us to provide services, all the private payers allowed us to provide services, federal and state laws allowed that, and that will continue to the end of this year. On the federal front, we're watching closely two particular federal bills. I'm going to touch on this one here that's important. It is its fourth time coming to the Senate floor is the Connect for Health Act. Um, I remember when this bill was written a while ago, several years ago, and it would allow us as healthcare professionals to be permanent on the Medicare provider list and continue to service patients after the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, we also wanted to be able to service Medicare, Medicaid, and Medi-Cal patients, and that's why that bill started way back when. A couple of the important parts of the waivers is the HIPAA privacy and security waivers were, I mean, were all the security measurements were waived, meaning that you could provide services through any hardware, iPad, cell phones, whatever, any software. The software did not have to be compliant, uh, as will have to happen at the end of uh, this year, or the beginning of 2022. So software, being able to have portals and be able to uh, log in all requires um, several measurements of security. I'll give an example. So early on in the pandemic, when practitioners needed to have a Zoom experience, a lot of them just latched on to the free account of many softwares. That free account does not meet federal guidelines for security. Most of these software companies, including Zoom, as I'm going to use in my example, have a healthcare solution. It's more expensive because that solution had to meet all these requirements uh, by the federal government and state government. So starting when this P, when the public health emergency ends, if you are a member here and you are providing services and you're not providing them through a secured portal or software, you will have to do that. I also will suggest to you that we will not be able to probably use our iPad unless the iPad is using a vendor software that is compliant. So we'll see that begins to look like as we get towards the end of the year. In regards to the service models during the pandemic, I brought this up already. Is
own professional organization that in the future soon, we look at how we bring those consultation codes back. I believe that wellness is an area where we're really consulting. I wouldn't consider what I do as an intervention as much as educating, supporting lifestyle. Well, we have a trending word called lifestyle medicine, right? Where we're affecting the whole person that includes nutrition, includes coping strategies, includes mental health. And they may not really fall under a clinical billable moment, but they are a service given in a consultation model. And we lay and we want to bill for that. And then this idea of monitoring, remote patient monitoring. I know that we have folks here, part of membership, who are on a team who have created um, technology enabled um, devices that do monitor and measure certain things, especially in the neuro neurological population, but they're not really fitting underneath the definitions that exist under remote patient monitoring. And up until this pandemic, um, it was not our professions, Allied Health, that was doing the monitoring. It was more a hub and spoke model where the hospitals were sending a portal home. It would ask the patient to do vital signs. Those vital signs would be Bluetoothed in. There was a telehealth coordinator. And if those vital signs fell outside a parameter, it, it, it would it'd ring and ding. And then someone would contact that patient because it was important in chronic disease management. I would suggest to you moving forward and out of the pandemic that we need to move out of these traditional payment and service models and be allowed to have access to our patients on an ongoing basis, right? Not just when insurance stops paying, but allowed to have these ongoing e-visits and virtual check-ins or other visits that we want with our private payers that say, hey, I'm seeing Mrs. Smith, and she has multiple sclerosis. And I want to check in with her once a month just to see how she's doing and see if there's a flare up and see if there's a moment where I can engage with her again to remind her of how to properly use her joints or energy conservation or an ADL moment. And so we may want to bill for that. In my practice, we do this already. I'm a cash based um, practice. And so without having to worry about billing for this, I will do ongoing consultation and monitoring of my patients. Again, anything that we talk about today, I want to just bring up to you that we're going to continue to be a part of this technology networking group and that you're going to continue to find the resources that we can that talk about these service and business models going forward through the telehealth task force too. Again, just a quick reminder to go back and keep checking in uh, with our networking group on what uh, these particular things will look like after the telehealth, uh, after the um, public health emergency. So I wanna go ahead and look at rehab now and rehab after December 31st and what I feel it's gonna look like and where I feel we need to develop our research uh, and data collection at. So again, our waivers are in place until the end of the year. There are over 70 federal bills. Um, I think we'll see a lot of movement going quickly during the summer. At this point, a lot of the focus of the Biden administration has been tackling the immediate efforts of vaccinations um, and other things you can see on TV every single day. So uh, I do believe it was important to get uh, President Biden through the first 100 days. I do know that we have a lot of bills on the floor. We will have to look at and, and support us, support these important bills through our lobbyists, through our organizations, uh, and these two bills to move forward uh, in the way we best can see our patients. Again, several states have not waited uh, to develop their own telehealth um, regulations post pandemic. So California is one of them. I'm in a parity state. I could already perform services. I could already get paid. And the state of California has already passed the law that regardless of what the federal law says, we're going to be able to provide care post pandemic. However, that does not mean I get to see Medicare patients because anything that is supported by the federal insurance programs, it can only be um, uh, integrated and adopted by the feds and allowed to continue by the federal government. So statewide, though, I can provide the services. And I say that to you, the membership, because you need to, this is my encouragement for you to go back and check in with your board. The boards of OTPT speech will be writing some official documents and should be writing official documents on states as they adopt these telehealth laws post pandemic. I'm going to just touch on two quick policy bills to keep your ears and eyes open uh, on and also how these bills have written into it research, believe it or not. So the Connect for Health Act is this bill that's been around quite a while for many years. It will per um, permanently remove all these uh, the geographic restrictions. So prior to the pandemic, 
I could not bill my patient and see them at, at their home. They had to be uh, go to a particular qualified site and there I could see them. Well, that really doesn't give me access to my patient, as you know. Secondly, we know that it's best for us to see our consumer, our patient in their homes, in their work, in their schools, in their community. So we can see that what we're doing is being transferable and translating into their lives, their daily lives. That's the value that we bring to the table. And importantly, we're gonna take away the need to have any more federal bills to have these waivers, which was the problem prior to the pandemic. And I highlighted in blue uh, an important part of this Health Act, the CONNECT Act, which was it mandates studies of how telehealth has been used during the pandemic and the effectiveness of these waivers. Did we really hit those telehealth benefits that I shared with you? And how did we do that? And is it the same quality of care? So I encourage all of you out there to look at how we can gather this data through narrative stories, pass on to our lobbyists through research. And the reason why this was written into the bill is because we know that insurance, insurance payers will only pay for things they feel have the evidence behind them, right? The quality of care, the value of the service being delivered through telehealth technologies. The Expanded Telehealth Access Act is the second bill important to us because it will permanently extend us uh, to this provider list um, and it will uh, protect what we're already doing with our Medicare folks. Um, at this point, my, my bottom bullet to you is at this point, we have I have read that Medicare will can pass post pandemic. If this bill does not pass, we will expect that Medicare will say to us in rehab, yes, you can see patients, but you can only perform the e-visits and the virtual check-ins. These are these shorter kind of visits that are not quote interventions, but in a sense could be kind of an intervention and they will remove the interventions because we're not on that provider list. So again, it's important for us to support our organizations and their lobbying efforts any way we can that we get the passage of these two bills. What are the important factors to look at in our research and in our um, support of our organizations moving forward? And where do we need that data around? And, and so I just brought this up through the Center of Connected Health Policy. These are sustainable factors of which we need to base our interests around the provider type. Are we the right provider to providing services online? And who is our consumer? And the service expansion, meaning what types of service lines worked really well or what specific services worked really well through telehealth? And do they, can we do that just by audio or an audio video? Or can we also capture more things through apps in a storm forward moment? Because we have states like California, which I could build asynchronous, but I don't have a lot of evidence of how we use the capturing information to do that. And then other things like parity and requirements for payers and licensure portability. So we will need these, this information around these things to be sustainable, not just past this pandemic, but ongoingly through um, the, uh, the practice of, of our rehab. And I, I just included this slide. And in fact, just a, a quick note, the handout that, you, that comes with this uh, webinar will have more slides in it, more information I'm giving today because there's so much information I can't talk about at all, but I wanted you to have it in a handout. So again, what is great about what happened during the pandemic is that we have a lot of our own professional organizations and organizations that existed prior to now, CCHP, collecting and monitoring federal policies, state policy, trends, um, standards of care, et cetera. And so I invite you to go back and check in with those. So let's take a look at what rehab looked like from my, um, from my end, my end being reaching out to providers, um, understanding from my positions at, at the American Telemedicine Association, reaching out to colleagues, and actually what I ended up having to do in my own practice, what service lines, what business models are we using and how they may look going forward. I, going forward, you're gonna hear the word using either hybrid practice models or business models, service models, or blended. Um, we, we hear the word blended more in the educational model of, of healthcare, uh, using the IEPs and seeing kids online in that um, school moment. And we end up, I hear the hybrid word being used more when we're talking about medical models, but it won't matter. They mean the same thing. So what do these practice models look like after the end of this year? Well, I shared with you, we're going to have a look at what hardware can be used and software requirements. They're all going to be have to be HIPAA compliant, regardless 
of whatever federal and state laws are passed, will have to be back in a compliant moment. And we'll wait to hear exactly if they limit that. They usually call it out in the federal uh, explanation or descriptor of exactly what that will have to be. We will, I feel, if we haven't done it already, we'll need to create uh, profiling at the beginning of the service to understand and screen uh, and triage what types of patients belong in telehealth moments and which have to be seen in person and or can they do both. And in my practice, I do both. I also have a screening that I perform at the time of, of the first phone call or, or an online in my portal that allows me and allows the system to understand what what my options are with this patient. And it's based on impairment. It's based on their ability to handle technology and several things. Um, and then we're gonna to have to go back and look at all those things that we have written as in our professional organizations. What are those best standards and practices? And maybe those same protocols work, but we're gonna to have to insert the words telehealth here and there. We're gonna to have to understand there's certain moments that for instance, that they, a person has to be in a space where they have six feet behind them because that's really when we get quality of care. I need the space and the privacy of the patient at home. So looking at those best practice standards and guidelines, I would say that I feel that that will be something that the technology networking group and certainly our task force will continue to look at moving forward is where do we make those edits and changes nationally and statewide to make sure that everyone is following best practice standards and guidelines for value and quality. And then we're gonna see reimbursement changes just because it happens. No payer wants to pay forever. So we'll constantly be looking at coding changes, billing changes. And I would tell you that I already know that payers are beginning to come up with the auditing. So their first line of auditing will be to, like they did before, asking for assessments or evaluations or asking for satisfaction surveys. They need to begin to understand how we as providers are going to basically prove that the quality of care was the same done online. So we'll need to look at what are those standards of practice that we can use, or what are those surveys, or what are those monitoring pieces that we can provide at the end of care, during care, to promote the value of our care. Before the pandemic, most of the payers just wanted us to provide satisfaction, uh, a satisfaction survey at the end. And they're very simple, and that's all they required. I haven't heard they're gonna do more than that, but I also heard that they are going to come up with what they want us to, to look at. So our research at this point in our data gathering should be around how do we demonstrate quality at the end of care, during the care, and perhaps in, in, enroll some of those um, participation screenings and tools at the beginning of care. I think an important part of moving forward will be re-examining the human factor. Part of the problem to telehealth and adoption was providers didn't feel that they could have that same human relationship online as they could in person. And so what are the human factors that we need to address? Maybe that means I communicate differently online. Maybe that means I see the person, I see a, a person in person first, and then we go to online next. Um, what does that look like ethically to our care? And I'll, I'll, I have uh, some slides that I, I provide in the PDF for you to look at the ethical and legal guidelines around telehealth. I do think we need research around some of those um, and those human factors. And then again, moving forward in a blended model, every provider will have to understand what their comfort level is in using technology. Some people just don't like it. They don't feel that they um, are making the same, uh, having the same outcomes um, that they could have if they were seeing their patient completely uh, online. And I have heard from colleagues um, distinctly that they did not like telehealth, they're not planning on spending their money on, on me meeting the requirements moving forward and that they're gonna require people to drive to them. And I am telling you, if that's the way you're planning on existing, that pretty soon that's not gonna work because these younger generations coming up um, who are under 65, don't want to drive, traffic's too rough. They understood they had to, could have a good relationship in certain service models with their provider. And so we're gonna see a lot of movement uh, in the next five years, I'm assuming, as, as generations will move through technology and want to only see their person and their, and their doctor and their provider like me online. So in my looking and reaching out to providers, uh, colleagues, what were some of the services that were done through the pandemic? And here's a slide that just represents um, where I found providers still wanting to go in person uh, and those that were easily moving and, and engaging 
and simple and engage progressive exercises and other program service models and service lines um, um, online. So in person, I think people still feel they need to do really high quality standardized testing in person. I would suggest that I think there's ways to do that so certainly online. It depends if you need to palpate your patient, of course, Modality scar management, safety checks, still, you know, people feel that has to be done. Some parts of pain management, edema control, and customized splint making. Some of those you look at and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, I need to have my patient in my clinic. Um, some of those I think are up for grabs, a little bit of, of yes and yes. Um, I know with my modalities, I can simply send out a TENS unit and be able to train them online versus having them come in and see me for that. And then I think things that we found that worked really easy online were this progressive home exercise program, ADL checks could be done online, some progressive sensory activities with kids, motor learning, fine motor learning, gross learning, disease management, care management can be done online, ergonomics of which my company does in the workplace, caregiver training and splint selection. Those are probably each on their own a separate webinar and I'm always happy to talk more about what that looks like. I'll give you some examples here. So moving forward post pandemic, again, the most popular way of seeing our patient is to go uh, online right through video conferencing. We recognize we already had some information around these different service lines and population groups that we still have them, but we'll have to have research that specifically looks at these early intervention to rehab, to community, to SNFs, to employee health. These are the type of services that were, have, we have some information around and that I provided and, and providers were providing during the pandemic. So all different types of service lines, which I've shared with you in a previous slide. So all of these services could be done well online. We need to be able to qualify how well they were done. And I saw in, in a beginning of what I love about what we can do online, which is prevention of, of impairments, right? I think having access to my patient allows me to educate them so we can prevent injuries from coming more serious or we can help prevent the chronic disease management from having a flare up. And again, really around things we talked about in our professions early on, which is care management, case management, patient education. Those are so important to what we do every single day. We verbalize it a lot in in person, but being able to have a moment just doing that online, I think is gonna be important. So that's where that consultation idea comes in. Moving forward towards the pan through the pandemic and afterwards, we're gonna to have to go back and make sure we have policies and procedures around technology, administration, and clinical. We are gonna to have to have policies and procedures. If they audit us, they're gonna audit our policies and procedures around that. We're gonna to have to have other clinical key documents there. You need the telehealth informed consent. You'll have to prove your competency because that will be state-based and you're gonna to have to be able to probably have a satisfaction survey at the end. Again, technology requirements, again, Right now we can use any device. We'll see what they say about phones and iPads at the end. Softwares are gonna to have to be HIPAA compliant like Zooms and Doxies and all the other simple therapies, whatever all the other softwares that you use to have video conferencing will have to be HIPAA compliant. I think we need to understand when and if we need other people in the room with our end user, our patient. In policy, in papers, we call this e-helpers again. If we profile the patient up and have a screening up front, we'll probably be able to identify whether or not they need someone else in the room versus not having the therapy session at all. I know that with me, I with my neurological patients, I need someone else with them during my online moment. We need to be able to screen that up front and be able to determine that up front, make sure that happens for all sorts of purposes. So again, personnel requirements. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. You'll have this in the handout with some additional considerations when you're providing care online. These will stay in place. They're already in some of our position papers moving forward. Um, I suggest to you that if you haven't reached out that you will reach out and understand whether or not your professional liability insurance still covers you. Um, I know that HPSO, which is what I have does, and you may see a difference in policy moving in the area of liability insurances as we move beyond the pandemic. So check in and when you pay your yearly fee, check in with them, ask those questions about providing services ongoingly because they will cover you. They're the ones who will be showing up with the lawyer if you are getting sued. Key ethical points, points I want to just highlight here that affect research is the 
how much competency do we need? And is this already fitting in our scope of practice? And being able to have research and, and more information around the effectiveness, the value of the services that we provided through telehealth technologies, and are we culturally competent? When we have access to everybody, are we really the best person or do we need to have more competency in that human factor moment, right? So it's not just the service we're giving, it's how we're relaying that services. And then again, moving forward through the pandemic, where is that payment? Where are those payment models? Is it a bundled payment? Is Medicare gonna allow us to continue to see their, their beneficiaries? Are the payers gonna require more for their money? That kind of thing. So at the minute we're getting paid. After we leave here, we'll still get paid. I just think there are gonna be more paperwork requirements. So let me give you some examples, case uses of care going on right now and how I think care will look like. I'm gonna to give to you a hybrid model, the blended models that I see going on. And certainly these are happening through my practice. So this is a tele, uh, an orthopedic treatment and unconsultation session. This person called me, they only wanted to discuss a few items. They didn't want a full on hour. They just wanted to triage. They had a specific question in mind around pain management and do's and don'ts around a shoulder impingement. So I set up a quick moment Moment. We went through it. I used it to triage whether or not I needed a whole hour with them. They felt they would try my recommendations at first, which was icing, um, working around and understanding pain levels of which to do activities, and then providing other sorts of modalities to help them with uh, some of their muscle pain. Example number two is the senior who I saw in person in the beginning to do the assessment. And then I saw them online in their home and providing them with their intervention that lasted anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. You'll have these on these slides. I'm just gonna kind of zip through this. This also is a person I do e-checks in between. So if, they, if we had a session at the beginning of the week and I only see them again next week and something else came up, they're allowed to get a hold of me. We'd have a quick check-in and I'd say, yes, you're doing it correctly. That's fine. Continue to do those exercises and we could jump online. Example number three is neural treatment and consulting. So this was a consulting session. At the time of the pandemic, the wife was going to be helping my patient do his exercise program at home. And they really needed just sort of a caregiving moment. I wouldn't call it an intervention. I could call it more of a consultation moment of which I was re kind of assessing the caregiver, the spouse and how well she was helping her, her husband do the exercises that he was given. And of course, he and I did also have interventions moving forward online and now in person. The PEDS telehealth is a young child, school age intervention and goals, things that can be done online or here are just an example. Um, of things that can be done. Often we look at equipment. I send my equipment out to my homes ahead of time or I have them buy it ahead of time and then we get ready for our intervention. Um, and if they come to me in person, a lot of times if I know I bring them in, I bring them into my office in clinical moments so I can teach them how to use the equipment I'm gonna give them and I send them back home. So in that hybrid moment, I may say, I need to stop at your house or you need to come to me. Let's go through the next um, goal of the plan of care and then I'll send you home and I'll just see you at home. So sometimes for even for me, it's the exchange of what's easiest and what works. And again, with my, my folks I do with the disease, in, disease management, I, I have a monthly check-in list. I call them, I check with them online. We go through the profiling of their, how well they're doing um, in care management, and we provide their care for uh, that way once a month. Um, and again, a quick um, employee, we have a program with still manufacturing companies. We treat and triage muscle skeletal injuries at the time, time of complaint. They jump online with us. We provide the care. We try to keep them from having that complaint go to an injury or go to workers' comp. So I talked really, really fast. Um, in conclusion, those examples I shared with you, I believe will continue where it's up to the provider to understand how to profile and screen up front to decide which services at the time of services that you want in your plan of care can be done in person and online. You heard from me, there are moments, even I will say to my patient, let me drive to your house and see you or come to my clinic because where we're going next, I think it will take me putting my hands on you and teaching the equipment that may be difficult for whatever reason um, to be done online. Um, and then I'll send you back home and we'll integrate it into your home, into your home or community. Okay, I am going to open up um, the session, the webinar for questions.
Thank you, Ms. Richmond, for the really interesting and very, very informative presentation. I absolutely love the examples that you gave. Um, if you have any questions from the audience, please feel free to either uh, type it down in the chat, or if you are comfortable, please come off of mute and ask your questions. We have a question from Brandy, go ahead. Let's go ahead with Brandy's first. Okay. Um, any tools available for testing range of motion or strength virtually? So if you're looking, we, originally there were some great ROM um, software apps, um, which you could have the patient install at home and get some range of motions. I haven't seen those work well. We saw those actually disappear before the pandemic. Um, to be honest, um, I have not seen where, well, I shouldn't say that they're in development where we can actually use the software through an avatar system where we can actually get exact measurements in the orthopedic um, industry of the ROM. I would say at this point, most people are doing functional ROM. So in my case, I'll ask people to demonstrate hands overhead, hands behind back, um, and different uh, functional range of motion. If I need to measure that, I would need to have a second person at the home and send out out the measurement tool to do that. I think they always range. Oh, manual muscle testing. That's a good question. I'll tell you how I do that. It's very difficult because in the manual muscle testing for strength, right, you're pushing down on someone's arm. So I have identified that when I do that particular evaluation, I need to have a second person in the room. And that second person it has to be available ongoingly because their number is the one I use. So if I have my patient put out their arms and I say to my, my e-helper, push down as hard as you can. And I say to my patient, Tam, me. Resist that, resist that push as hard as you can. I'm just going to watch if your arms move in a certain way, your legs move a certain way. And I'll say to my e-helper, you know, it's five means the patient can do it on their own and they're breaking through your resistance, you know, what you'd say, which is firm and zero, meaning you're not getting anything right. We, we could see that visually. And so I use their number and I'll, and I will, and I will try to um, help them and describe what a four, what a three plus is as much as I can. I have a sheet I send out ahead of time that's in front of us in the video conferencing moment. And we try to grade it from there, but that's how I do it now. And next time I reevaluate that, I try to use that same person and we understand the same number line, the three plus four, four plus five, five minus, whatever it is. And so we try, they, they become my, my tool basically. Hope that helps. Uh, thanks, Tammy. Brandy says, thanks for that. That's what I've been doing and just wanted to see if there were other ways. Um, Not yet. Do you want to come off mute and ask your question or I can read it? Either way is fine with me. Um, this is Tracy. I can read my question. So uh, Tammy, thank you so much for this fantastic talk. I really appreciate you sharing your expertise. And I think it's impressive how expansive it is and also how many areas you were able to cover in such a short time. It was just really well executed. Um, you shared some really helpful information about what services might work better in person versus virtual. I'll be referring back to that for sure. Um, I am interested in hearing about your thoughts on, you know, whether this is research-based or just your personal experiences about patient variables or patient characteristics that are possibly going to be related to more positive health outcomes or telehealth outcomes. So I think a lot of these um, are about the actual services that are provided, but I'm curious about, you know, and I think at the end you had kind of made a comment about, um, how folks who are maybe of a younger generation might be more naturally suited in actually seeking telehealth um, more so. And so we might be pushed to, to provide more, but are there specific patient characteristics or variables that you think are um, maybe making patients a better match for telehealth services versus others? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I would say that we, we didn't certainly did not have enough, inf enough research uh, on evidence around I think I think there's several layers to your question. Who's the ideal patient, or how do I determine the ideal patient? So, um, and um, and how that may look going forward, and by choice, right? So there's certain things. There's there's the actual um, impairment scaling. Like in my 
practice, we have a screening device that looks at their impairment model. So um, for instance, what would raise more questions is if I have a neurological patient who can't pa go past two or three um, decision-making moments, you know, sequential, um, they have some cognitive impairments, they may have some physical impairments, um, they may have, in, in, in a, a typical standardized assessment, I have figured out that I can't see them alone, and so the question is, can I see them if they have a person there? So, and, and generally speaking, we don't have enough research around that, that would be a good place to start. Secondly, um, I have created screening for myself, and the screening is not so much, well, I guess it is, number one, can I see them online? Number Number two is if I see them online, do I need a second person? Number three is, are there going to be limits to my plan of care by seeing them online only? Um, or have identified in the beginning of profiling them that I need to also make a home visit and they come to me. And then there is the other component of technology. So one of the screening, screening um, questions I have in my screening tool is, and this is where we need a lot of development of screening tools actually, is the triaging moment, is do they feel comfortable with the technology? Do they feel, what do they have for technology? And often one of my questions are, do you own cable TV? Do you, do you watch movies? Because then that lets me know they have enough bandwidth. Although within my portal, if I I go in line with somebody, I get a notification if their bandwidth isn't strong enough. So yes, we need tons of research there on profiling the patient, the screening, what are the th questions I should be asking? How do I decide that who's, who's best for, 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 being, uh, for going online? Um, and maybe that helps determine and triage and profiling and predicting the outcome of care. I don't know if I answered that, I probably went all over the map, but it's an area, this is really, these are my you know, observations of folks doing it in my own experience here working in telehealth. It was over the map in a good way. Um, you, you raised some things I hadn't thought of, Tammy, and, and I'll be um, referring back to my notes on that. Thank you. Thank you. There was a question in the chat about the handout, and I just wanted to point out that the handout and the recorded lecture webinar will be available within 48 hours on the link that I've provided in there. This is the ACRM's uh, technology networking group tech talk page, and uh, this webinar and previous webinars and forthcoming webinars will all be available here. So you'll also be able to access the handout here. Um, while we are waiting for some questions. I would like a question, uh, ask a question to Tammy. Um, we have, you have covered a lot of the content in relation to research and the direction and the next steps for research and for clinicians to start thinking uh, in the aspect of telehealth. And I wanted to ask, uh, as an as an educator, what are what are some aspects that we absolutely want to make sure our uh, graduating professionals are. Um, are prepared for or are aware of? Are, are there certain academic um, pointers that, and I, I, I know it could, it could be a webinar of its own, but are there some uh, starting places that app need to be absolutely covered in the curriculum? Um, in the curriculum, you know, um, wow. You know, uh, I, th I think I, my beginning, my, I guess my beginning, of, to understanding telehealth and, and services and research is just the very beginning, understanding the terminology, understanding uh, why that terminology exists and looking at new emerging technologies. So while we're trying to catch up to the rest of the physician models on technology, we also have emerging things like AI and machine le learning. I'm working on a profiling piece so we can do risk profiling, um, all of those. So we have the advent of new understanding, new emerging technologies that are gonna move very, very quickly as we see more players moving into healthcare like Amazon. And then we have just all of us trying to catch up. So as an educator, um, students need to know the terminology. And, and that is important because if you're moving into research and writing, it needs to match because otherwise we can't use it as evidence to support policy and payment. Um, secondly, I think there's an understanding again of the human factors and the end user and the provider. Um, if we don't have adoption of those two areas, it's not gonna go anyway. And so I think looking back over the of, of COVID-19, 
is I would be asking my students, this is the same thing that Tracy asked me, can you identify perhaps right now, what would, what would interfere with a, 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 an intervention or assessment online from the provider end and from the consumer end? And once we identify those, we get so much more, we get, that opens up a whole door of understanding how well this can really work, right? And so then we go into assessments. We need to look at current assessments that we already have and how can we modify those and use those so we can provide the beginning of plan of care um, and then moving through intervention. I do think on the back end moving forward um, is again, the human factor. And then also looking at what did not work well. So we need to go out there and survey and we need to understand um, what was, what you know really from the provider end and from the consumer end, what was your worst complaint? Was it, what device and, and, and or simple, what were the hardwares that you liked? Well, I have clients who only want the iPad to be honest. And I don't know if I can only use the iPad after the pandemic's over. I have people happy to jump on me in the cell, off their cell phone because they're young and that's what they have with them all the time. So just the comfort use of technology, the comfortable use, then the effective use, and then the dosage, right? Is the dosage is, I see them in person during this moment and the rest of the dose of the plan of care is in person. So I don't know, there's so many places to go, but my first is terminology, understanding um, what we're talking about. And then looking at the end user, both ends, and then looking at standardized care and, out, and what the basics are to outcome measurements, you know, that satisfaction survey. And then I move back to triaging tools for screening and then begin to look at interventions. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. that I think that's a real, really nice summation. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody here would like to continue on the discussion and have some more questions and comments, but we are out of time. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Richmond, for sharing your expertise. Thank you everyone for attending today's Tech Talk. Our next Tech Talk will be in August, so stay tuned for more information on that. Uh, the recording of this presentation will be available in the next 48 hours. Please recommend this Tech Talk series to your colleagues, and I hope you have a really good rest of the day and a good weekend. Great. Thank you.